Snow. Go slow. Go slow. Please, please go slow. You don't want to go fast. Maybe. <coughs> There's nothing in it for me. You know, I go at the pace I go, and when the Friday comes, I just stop. Doesn't matter. Is that right? You're the boss. You tell me. <coughs> now she's going to say, I'm just a student. That means you have to sit the exam. Right? Have you told them about the exam? Did you tell them about the exam? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, instead of preparing for the exam. It's not time. You're not starting until it says recording started. Okay. Right then. Um, Good morning. You look very cheerful today. I don't know why. There's sort of something wrong with you. It's Wednesday. You should be exhausted, right? But there you go. Okay, so um, we have talked a bit about fluid dynamics. We have talked about modes. So what we're going to do today is we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about perturbation theory, a little bit of time because I'm gonna set it up so that we can do an application where modes enter, right? And that application, it's all gonna be in Newtonian gravity today. Uh, there are reasons for that. I can come clean straight from the beginning. The first part I could do in general relativity. In fact, I came in and had a sneak peek at the blackboard from the previous lecture. There's a strong connection to what you've seen because it's going to invent, invent, connect things like conserved quantities and symplectic products and stuff like that, which you may or may not care about, but that, that, that will come in. Okay? I could do that in general relativity. I could just copy down those lectures and do some things that are related. That's fine. The problem I'm going to do as an illustration is the problem of tides, how a binary companion raises a tide in a neutral star. I don't know how to do that problem in general relativity. When we get to that point, I'll tell you why. But I know how to do some parts of it, but not all of it. Okay? So that's <clears throat> to be done, something that people are working on. So we're going to get up to as close to what people are thinking about as possible today, which I think is good. Okay, so. All right, so the first thing we're going to do, oh, the volume came up, great, you can whisper. First thing we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about Lagrangian perturbation theory in Newtonian, okay? Extension to general relativity is not super difficult, but the difference is in Newtonian, we always pull out the time as being special, right? Other than that, the ingredients are the same, okay? But maybe um, the natural thing to ask is something like this. Why should we do this? So, depending on your inclination, the answer could be, well, you know, the mathematics is beautiful. But if you're a physicist, or especially an astrophysicist, beautiful mathematics might not be the thing that gets you excited. Okay? And so, that might not work. But there's a nice physical intuition for why we need Lagrangian perturbation. I've drawn this before. Imagine a little fluid element, a piece of fluid that flows, okay? Now, this is Newtonian, so I'm going to draw that as a, something with a velocity V, say, okay? So 
This is just in space, it moves with some velocity v. Now we've seen that when we do the thermodynamics, we do that in this box, right? That's where the equation of state lives, right? And as we move the box, we try to keep track of where the box is. What's in the box stays in the box, right? That's their logic. And so I need to keep track of the fluid elements for the thermodynamics. <clears throat> We've seen that. Yesterday, I introduced sneakily the Lagrangian perturbation. I used it in the calculation. So this is important if you make statements like I did yesterday that something is frozen, say the number of electrons is frozen in this box. I need to make sure I'm tracking the same box because you have changed the volume I change the number of particles and clearly the number of electrons is not gonna stay fixed, right? So I need to keep track of this box. So that's the first part. Now, uh, you can ask yourself in the Euler equations, so the momentum equation, has, effectively a directional derivative, right? We have something like EJ, grad J, EI, up or down. Like this, right? We saw that yesterday, do the Newtonian physics, this comes up, right? Now, when you did general relativity, differential geometry, whatever you did, you probably talked about the meaning of this directional derivative, right? Maybe people say yes. People in the front say yes. I'm going to assume everyone else is saying what? So, <clears throat> now you want, might want to recall that this combination has to do with parallel transport. That's where this kind of thing comes into the geodesic equation in 4D and things like that. And that's indeed the kind of thing that is used here, right? So uh, now being incredibly advanced, let's say we have a red vector what we're saying is we track this vector, it still says parallel to itself, right? That's the parallel transport. But now imagine you're trying to keep track of a box of fluid that shape changes shape as it moves, right? So for example, let's say that that box is a bigger box, just otherwise I can't, so it connects, so this, this is one edge of the box, let's call it one. This is the other edge of the box, call it two, okay? And the box is, one side of the box is here, okay? Now, a bit later, the fluid flows. So up here, point one has moved over here, point two is slowed down, so it moves over there. So the edge of the box is here. Right? I want to keep track of this box. Now, clearly, if this is, this is a vector, right? But this idea of parallel transport doesn't capture how this has changed because it parallel transports. So this is not the derivative I want, right? The derivative I want is the lead derivative. Because the lead derivative is the derivative that keeps track of this difference. Oh, be careful now. 
is if I write that with a VI upstairs, then it's zero. Okay. So this is not, uh, I haven't done any calculations, and so just tried to motivate why when you start doing Lagrangian perturbation theory, Newtonian or relativistic, the lead derivative enters. There's no, no real way around it. People that come from classical physics that never did general relativity don't like it. But what they miss is, for example, when you derive in fluid dynamics, you derive the equation for vorticity conservation, really natural to write it in terms of a lead derivative instead of the convective material derivative you're used to. So when people do this in fluid dynamics textbooks, they add in that extra piece you get from the lead derivative in the equation and say, oh, look, we, need, we get this extra piece. Don't worry about it. That extra piece is just the lead derivative. So if you know a lead derivative from the top, which, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't, then you're winning. And it's much more natural, you understand what's going on. So that's the preamble. Okay, so now we're gonna do some uh, little calculations. Okay, so now we're gonna define a Lagrangian perturbation of some quantity Q. It could be a scalar, it could be a vector, it could be a co-vector, it could be anything. It could be a tensor, it doesn't matter. Simply as the Eulerian perturbation at the point. So this is Lagrangian. This is Eulerian plus the lead derivative of the flow. Oh, sorry, lead derivative along some vector psi. But this is the displacement vector. That's the definition. Now, I want to do fluid dynamics. I just talked about how it's really important to me to keep track of where this box is, what shape is got and things like that, because I want to do thermodynamics. But I also want to do gravity, right? And gravity doesn't have a sense of flow like this. So the problem is for fluids, I need to be Lagrangian. For gravity, I need to be Eulerian. Basically fix my observers in space and I see what gravity does. So I kind of have a conflict here. And you're gonna see that I'm gonna write the equations as if they were Eulerian. I'm gonna derive them here, write them as if they were Eulerian, but keep track of this. I'm gonna to try to describe everything in terms of this. Okay, so it gets a bit, you know, it's like a mixture of different things. So that, this is the first definition. And the second definition is we say that the Lagrangian variation in the velocity, the upstairs velocity components is just the time derivative of this guy. So obviously, if this is a change in position, this is clearly a velocity, right? And so this is the perturbed velocity in the Lagrangian sense. But if that's true, the metric doesn't vanish under the this definition, right? Because in flat space, so this is Newtonian, the metric is fixed. There are no real variations there, but the lead derivative of this guy is going to give you the usual grad i psi j plus or symmetry. You can symmetrize this if you want to be fancy, that doesn't matter, right? And so that means that I need to be careful now. Like everything, um, when you have a derivative or something that 
involves the metric not vanishing, you need to keep track of if you call a contravariant, if it's a momentum or a velocity, things like that. So here, sure, you get the thing you expect, but you also get the difference in the, um, between the covariant and contravariant in the derivatives. Something like this. Okay. So that's the machinery. And now, if you want, this can be your exercise to work on at two in the morning, right? When we have the inspection. You don't know about the inspection? They're looking shocked. Sorry, I'm just talking nonsense. But don't worry about it. Just try to wake you up. We're not going to come and check that you're working at two o'clock in the morning. As amusing as that would be, actually, we should send the campus security. That's the thing to do. Knock, a really hard knock on your door at two o'clock in the morning. A big man saying, are you calculating? But the problem is you'll probably come and knock on my door. And then I don't know what will happen. Okay. Now you could prove this. We're not going to do that because it's going to take us too long. But I want to use this because this is a shortcut. Okay? You can show that if you take the lead relative on, or the Lagrangian perturbation of dt plus v of v as an operator, then these two commute. Probably easiest to show in examples, but we're not, we're just, I'm just going to use it, okay? Because it's true. Okay, so maybe I should box that because I'm not talking to you. And then we want to look at things like barrier number conservation. Baryon density, number density. So we had PTN plus grad I N V I. That's what we had yesterday, right? So now I want to make use of this as much as I can, obviously. So now I can look at this and ask, okay, so what is this then? So I know for a scalar, I know that Li of V of N is just Li J rad of EI maybe, rad I N, right? I have that sitting here, but it's not this whole thing. So I rewrite this as DT plus Li of V on N, Plus uh, another bit, the divergence. Okay. And then I go to my trick and I say, now I want to perturb this. So hit this with a delta. The delta goes straight through. This is easy. And then I need to spend some time doing this. I think that's one of the problems with the tutorial. So I'm going to leave that to my able helper. He's thinking, what, me? And now he's gonna, you're gonna see him start calculating. Anyway, so this gives me straight away, um, this piece, and then the thing to work out, which is not so nice, I have to tell you, this is not super nice. And then you put you a little bit of calculation. Now I have to tell you a story about this. You know, it's very, very common in papers and books that people, people write think a little bit of calculation, a bit of algebra does, it leads to this, okay? 
What do you feel when you read that? Do you think it's true that it's a little bit, or do you think this is long? I don't know how many of you have read or seen Chandra Sekhar's book on black hole uh, perturbations and stuff like that. You can put your hand up high, you should be proud, okay? It's not a, it's not a sort of geekery, this is real science. Okay? In Chandra's book, you'll find there is a statement like this, and a footnote, okay? And the footnote says something like this. I paraphrase because I can't remember the exact words. It says, 200 pages showing this has been deposited in the Chicago University Library. A little bit of algebra. So sometimes this is true, this kind of just a little calculation, sometimes it's 200 pages that you have to leave in the library. Okay? So, you know, maybe that was Chandra's humor, I'm not sure. But, okay. Anyway, we do this calculation, you can see that there's going to be some relationship here. This is going to certainly give us a gradient or a divergence of delta VI, which was this time derivative here. There's only one little bit missing bit, which is what we're going to do with this delta here. That's, that's the tricky bit. So what comes out of this is that delta N is just minus, because there's a plus here, N, rad on psi, or divergence of psi, or if you want, that delta n Eulerian is minus divergence on n psi. Okay, so that's an awful lot of work for something I could just have written down without calculating. If I didn't think too hard, because I could just say, okay, look, let's just be Eulerian. That goes through all the derivatives without any problems. Let's go through here. V, suppose it's a static model, it vanishes in the background. The only thing that, that, that just comes out straight away. The difference is this calculation allows me to use this result when the background velocity doesn't vanish. So I can use this for rotating stars or collapsing stars or whatever I like. So this is general, but it's easy to show it in the static, or easy to see that this has to be the result in the static. Okay. Now, um, I'm not going to write down, am I? Oh, maybe, yeah. Let's do it. The gravitational potential, we have the Poisson equation. Or M, mass per particle and number density, right? So now if I do a Lagrangian variation on this, clearly I have the right hand side because these are just numbers, I've done that. And then you can show that the Lagrangian variation commutes with the Laplacian. Again, it's a little bit of work, okay? But, so that's quite easy at the end of the day. Maybe that's not true. That's not the way to do it. Sorry, I take that back. Absolutely, take back everything I said. Rewind, rewind the tape. Sorry, tape, that was like 1980s. I'm old, okay? You push that button on streaming service, services where it says go back 15 seconds. That's what we should do. So we're going to use Eulerian because, as I said, gravity doesn't care about flows. So then the Eulerian commutes immediately with this. I get an Eulerian thing over here, but I just gave you a result for the Eulerian thing there. So that's, this is how we connect. Okay. And now if you want, 
this is a derivative or the derivative, there's a derivative there, you can actually integrate that, right, once, if you want. You can get something that says how the gradient of delta phi behaves, right? Uh, but you have to pick up some constant vector that you might need to figure out what it does. A constant in the sense of the covariant derivative. We all need that now. So now we have the momentum equation. Woohoo. Uh, so we need round um, pi. Um, something like that. That's we saw and used yesterday. And now I'm going back here. I am absolutely committed to this expression. I want to make use of it, right? So the first thing I do is I rewrite this. So you can, if you know lead derivatives, you know this is a piece of the lead derivative. What's missing for the downstairs object is V, Vj, rad i, Vj upstairs. That's gradient of V squared. Okay? And so you can rewrite this as dt as Levy on Vi plus a gradient of some object I'm going to call H plus a phi plus a half B squared minus. And what I've done is I've cheated as I wanted a total gradient. I've cheated by saying there will exist an object such that this is true, okay? This H is called the enthalpy. It's one of these thermodynamical words that it's defined like that. And you can see that it's defined simply to be able to pull things through here okay? so that I get an overall gradient and then if I have a time independent flow, this whole thing is gone, right? And then I get Bernoulli's law straight away from there. Yeah, that's right. This is exactly right. This is now basically an energy state. So it, that's, that's what's tricky. Now, might be helpful because this is a new word and it's a little bit mysterious as to why this should be true. So you can um, connect, I think, with what we did before. Where a single component, we had um, rad p was in grad mu, right? But this was the chemical potential, right? And now you can see the only difference here is that I have an N instead of a rho, it's just a particle mass. Right? So this enthalpy is really, in the single fluid, just chemical potential scaled with the mass. Okay? So these are connected. Now, in the two components or something with heat, that's clearly not going to be true anymore. This is more complicated. And then the question is, is there such a thing? There is such a thing, but it's much harder to connect with the ingredients, okay? 
but for a single component, this is not crazy. Okay? So that's a, just an indication, illustration of why this kind of makes sense. Okay, now, this is all completely primed because the Lagrangian variation commutes with this, and it also commutes with the covariant derivative of scalars. That's easy to show. And so, and that it commutes with the covariant derivative of scalars for the usual reason that the covariant derivative on a scalar is really just a partial. There are no Christoffels to play around with. And then that saves a lot of effort. Okay? And so now we get straight away. <coughs> Oh, sorry, that H plus that H a plus on phi minus one half B squared. So that's the perturbation equation. And this trick made life really, really easy for me. So if you take this on faith, or if you go away and calculate two o'clock to prove that this is true, it's up to you. It does work, work out. Uh, but for now, this is just real quick shortcut to this point, okay? Now, I want to write this in terms of the displacement vector psi. But before we start writing, let's, let's think, okay? What's going to happen here? Sometimes thinking before you do something is a good idea. Sometimes it's better not to think and just do it, because if you thought about it, you'll never do it, right? If you think a calculation is gonna to be too hard or very hard, you probably wouldn't get started. It could be better to get started and then find out how hard it is somewhere in the line when you're committed, right? So it, the fact that it's hard just makes you angry. I don't know. Okay, so let's see what we've got. This is clearly involving background velocity and no perturbations. This guy here, I know, because I've written it down over here, and I know it's gonna be a little bit messy, but I can write it in terms of the velocity and size. So this, I'm happy with that, I have that. Clearly, I'll get a lot of stuff that I need to expand, but it's going to be a second derivative of the psi. It's an acceleration, right? As it should be. This guy here is a bit messy because I said we didn't like this, but actually, this is just a scalar. So I need the bit I have, which I know I can already express in psi because it's kind of here. You need to use the Green's function probably to integrate these things, but it can be done, okay? And then, although actually, we need the gradient of this, and if we integrate this once, we have this gradient here. So that's probably fine. This delta B squared is clearly gonna be now, remember I have to be careful with upstairs and downstairs, right? So this is really, has a metric in it, is a contraction. So I need both the upstairs and downstairs. It's gonna be some combination of the two that I've written down. That's fine, okay? But I have them. And then this guy, well, this guy is gonna be something from here or something that depends on, so let's say again, in a single component case, it depends only on the number density and I have the number density over here. So that, that's also fine. So I, you see, I can, I can do this. It's gonna be a little bit messy. I'm not gonna go through the steps because I really want to write it in a schematic form, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna write down an expression and I'm really sorry, but it looks quite hairy. And I'm going, just gonna write it down for the single component. 
case. It looks the same in general with a few bits where it says H. It's going to be a little bit different, okay? Don't worry about it. I want to write it down because I want to point out where the different pieces are in the equation, okay? And it's a little bit long. I'm sorry about it. So I said we're going to get an acceleration. So we know that. We get some bits that are the material derivative on this displacement. It's not really surprising because we had this thing in the owner, owner equation, so it should be something like that. But then we start getting messy bits where these things combine. Things like the square of this acting on xi. That's a bit messier. Not clear what, where it comes from. We get the gradient of the Eulerian gravitational potential. That's expected. We get a really messy piece, psi j. This is why I have to copy it down because there's no way I remember this. Double derivatives. Double derivatives because effectively I need the derivative here and I have a derivative, lead derivative floating around in here already. So it's a double derivative there acting on phi plus h. That's this combination here. And then one more term. And this is where I've converted this h into m. So it's just going to be something like this, dh, dn, and j, dn, psi j. Now we step back and admire the work. Oh, no, no. So this is the general expression for a barotropic uh, fluid with arbitrary background velocity. I made no assumption. Okay. And so, for example, if the star is rotating, this is the background rotation, and you can see how that's going to come in. And so I think the first time this was written down was in a paper by John Friedman and Bernard Schutz in 1978. It's a very, very famous paper. It's particularly famous for what we're going to talk about tomorrow. It proves that rotating stars are generically unstable, improving on work that was done by Chandrasekhar in the late 60s, beginning of the 70s. What turned out was that a lot of people have done that kind of work, but because they didn't use the proper Lagrangian framework, they ran into trouble with some inconsistencies. This paper sorted that out by using this framework. And I think in Southampton, the students joke about, I have done for a long time, the fact that they're all forced to read that paper. And they basically, they don't, it's not like we tell them to read them at the same time, right? But at some point during their PhD, they have to read this paper. And then the older students come in and say, ah, You've reached the point of the paper. So that's our particular flavor, and that's the way it is. So this is a little bit too messy for us to keep on writing down, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to write this down in a schematic form. Okay? We're just going to say, what are the, actually, I've missed the thing here, sorry. There's a ton derivative there. Otherwise, this is disaster. What is on the board? is clearly something, let's call it A, which happens to be one, times the second derivative, right? That's this term here. 
and put the nadir because I can rescale this equation multiplied by some number, right? If I want. So it's going to look like that. Sometimes people want to have a density here to make this, you know, a proper momentum variable. But I'm going to take that to be one for now. Then we have something that's an operator acting on time derivative oxide, that's this here. Okay. And then we've got some stuff. All this stuff that acts on xi, this I can rewrite as something that acts on xi, even it's a bit implicit because I need to go through the root of the sitting here. This has xi and this has xi. So I can rewrite this as some gunk. Let's call it C, acts on xi. Okay, so the equation will look like this. And of course, if you want to be a purist, you'd say, well, I could have guessed that. Why do we spend 35 minutes of writing that down? I could have guessed that that had to happen, right? Because clearly it's a perturbed velocity displacement. Velocity is time derivative of displacement. I have to have an acceleration. So the first term is obvious. As V time, this is clearly going to give me a V times some time derivative. Second term is obvious, and the fact that I can rewrite the rest, it's, it's a no-brainer. It has to look like that. Okay. But there is method, even if maybe not good method, but there is method to this madness. We're going to see this soon. Okay. Thus ends part one. I need to find part two. I don't find part two here. Disperse. So keep this in mind, because what we're going to do now is today, we're going to do an application of this. And tomorrow, we're going to use this to prove, to carry out the Friedman Schutz proof from 1978 that stars are, rotating stars are unstable. Okay? The calculations are the same ingredients, but the calculation I'm going to do now is on what's called dynamical tides. And we're going to simplify this by assuming that the star is not rotating. So we're going to get rid of this B. Tomorrow the B will come back. Okay. And so the setup is a little bit like this. We have a mass M prime is in orbit with another mass, which we're going to call M. These are stars, okay? And we want to know. What is the tide that this guy raises on this guy? Okay. It's a Newtonian orbit problem. When you do this in a, you know, astronomy, or no, Keplerian orbits 101. You learn that there's a Fed central mass kind of thing, work out the reduced mass, of some single orbit object orbiting around this, you get Kepler's law that the frequency, orbital frequency squared goes like gm over distance cubed. You know, done. That's for part point particles. Now what we're asking is, this guy M prime can still be a point particle. Not going to worry about that now. It's not in reality, but 
the other guy has finite extent. It reacts, it deforms because of the tide. We want to work out how, and what I want to try to convince to you, convince you is that with this framework, we can work out how the modes of the problem, the modes we saw yesterday, the FPG modes and other modes, enter into this problem. That's the purpose of the exercise. Okay? So it really is a gory application of everything we've done. So first, so we assume that this is non-rotating. So that B guy over there is gone. So now we're going to cross him out. Sorry, but now you're gone. And then we need some bits. And now we're going to say, look, I've got this equation. Suppose I take two solutions to this equation. <coughs> Let's label this, call it cash, maybe. Let's call them psi and eta for now. Okay? They both solve solutions to this. Okay. Now let's define an inner product for these two solutions. Basically, let's write it like uh, this. And I'm going to be really sloppy and leave out indices because there's not going to be any real scope for confusion later. So this is defined as the integral of the complex conjugate of eta with psi integrated over the volume. That's the definition. Okay. No, sorry. I'm also going to put in a row here because I'm going to take If I take this a here to be one, so the equation is this, okay? then I need to compensate by putting the density in the inner product. Doesn't make any difference, it's just the same. Okay, now, with this inner product, this operator is emission. So this operator here that acts on psi. And what that means is, now that we've set A to one, it means we can focus on this. It just means that this guy, eta C psi, which is taking this equation and hitting it with eta, that's what I get, right? is the same as psi c eta conjugate. Okay. So what I get if I take the equation for eta and hit it with psi and conjugate. So that's the usual kind of emission argument. Okay, so now why is this useful to me? Well, let's see. Now I can build this, so let's call it a structure. This is beginning to sound a little bit familiar to the other things you've heard, right? In the first thing in the morning, I'm sorry, I'm getting, I'm seeming to converge in a disturbing fashion, but I'm gonna diverge soon, don't worry. But the language is the same because these structures are the same. This is where it comes from, right? So for fluid dynamics, it's very, very difficult to write down a Hamiltonian picture. Okay? 
especially for relativistic fields. I don't, I'm not sure, but I don't think a consistent, complete framework for Hamiltonian fluid dynamics exists. Lagrangian variational fluid dynamics exists and is very healthy. I claim that because I've written a 260 page living reviews article on that. Okay? So it's a big framework that people are using. Hamiltonian is really difficult. So for fluids, most things, if at all, tend to be Lagrangian. Now, even that is difficult because if you want to do a variational principle, you cannot write down a very, an unconstrained variational principle for fluids. You have to build in something like this. So you have to have a constrained variation. And that causes difficulties. There are different versions of doing that. And then the other thing is for fluids, we are mostly interested in non-ideal fluids, so fluids with viscosity. And then you can ask yourself, is it possible to write down a variational principle for dissipative systems? And the general statement in the literature is no, that's absolutely forgotten, don't go there. But myself and others have done that nevertheless because we don't listen to advice. And actually, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, it doesn't matter. Actually, intuitively, this makes sense because you know that general relativity is a dissipative theory in the sense that gravitational waves are emitted from systems, right? And yet, general relativity can be written down in the variational approach. So, doesn't that tell me that as long as I count all the energy, even the stuff that I lose in my system, I should be able to do that? So, some people say no. I would say yes. And then we can keep on arguing. But, you know, it's, it's a piece of mathematics. It's kind of interesting, but not completely developed, I would say. Okay, so we can invent this symplectic structure, which builds on this inner product. So I've got these two solutions. Now I'm just going to say, well, uh, because of my problem is non-rotating, all these operators, actually the C, is time independent, right? And that means that if xi, xi solves this, then the time derivative of xi solves this also. Okay? So I said that these two guys were two solutions. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to take one of them to be this guy. So here is one of these products. And then I'm going to subtract the other guy. So dt eta. And then let's ask what happens to the time derivative of this? So, or dt, maybe straight d, it doesn't matter, I suppose. Okay? We want to bring that inside this product. And the volume is essentially fixed. The background is not time dependent. So that really just becomes the time derivatives of these guys. And so this becomes et eta et xi plus eta second derivative of xi minus the second derivative of eta and xi minus et xi eta et xi. The first term and the last term are the same. So get rid of them. Okay. This guy and this guy are both dictated by this equation over here. So the second derivative is just the C operator times that. Okay. So let's use that. So this is minus this, this guy is minus C times this guy, minus, minus eta C xi. And this guy is minus minus is plus C eta xi. If 
But then we go back and look at the definition of the inner product. The second thing is this guy. First thing is complex conjugated. I conjugate the whole thing, and you just swap these over. That becomes conjugate, that one is not conjugate, right? And so let's do that on this guy. I can swap this over. That conjugating then just means moving these two guys over, okay? So this is actually minus eta six i plus psi c eta conjugate. But I just said, this is her mission. So this guy here is that guy there. And therefore, that's good. And this is really big. Because that means we now have a handle on conserved quantities, right? I'm not gonna go in that direction now, but tomorrow we're gonna write down a conserved energy, conserved angular momentum for the perturbations. And if you know anything about anything in physics, you know that conserved quantities, they're like gold dust, right? Because every conserved quantity allows you to simplify the problem by one variable, right? And so that's why we always look at symmetries and conserved quantities associated with the symmetries. And now I should say not occurrence or something like that, you know? I mean, not there's great contribution from Lagrangian variational calculus, how we get from symmetries to conserved quantities. And this is at the heart of this, right? So I don't want to do that now. I want to do something slightly different. Okay? What we're going to do is we're going to say now, I'm just saying that these are two solutions, right? But yesterday we learned about modes, right? So now suppose that this eta is uh, one of the modes. It could be uh, an F mode. I don't really care too much. And the other one is some other mode. Well, they can be the same. Right? So we just say that eta is say, and now I'm gonna mess it up a little bit, but don't worry about it. Eta is psi. This is just notation. Now I'm changing this and then put a label on it. Let's call him. Uh, no, let's do e xi first. Vector xi is xi, label it alpha, and then with some time dependence, like this. So this is the mode frequency that we tried to calculate yesterday with something that doesn't depend on time, okay? And then eta, and this is where I'm changing the notation. Recall all the mode eigenfunctions psi just with different labels, okay? And maybe I should not have used psi there, but that's, that's a small thing. And this has frequency omega beta, okay? This is an apple. And now we plug this in here, right? But now I know this psi i alpha and beta, these are not time dependent. So when I take this time derivative, it only affects this exponential. It brings down the frequency, right? And it's kind of easy to see. That if I take the time derivative of this, which I wrote out and ignore the fact first, I know that it vanishes and just hit these guys time derivative, this mixed bit is still going to disappear, right? But these guys, this is gonna give me a frequency squared. This is gonna give me a frequency squared with a minus sign because there's an i in each, i squared in each of them. 
and then I just get the product of these psi i alpha and beta. So with this, psi eta, this guy becomes just the difference between the frequencies squared. And then the inner product of these guys, so that didn't depend on, on time, and then e to the i. Oh, I'm gonna run over the line, oh no. People online are not gonna see the final mysteries. Well, okay, tough luck guys online in the internet world. Okay. So this comes out. So this should vanish because I shall prove that in general. So what does that mean? I'll give you a minute to think about it because I need to do some work over here. Well, what does this mean? It means that if I assume that the modes never have the same frequency, right? So that the mode spectrum is not degenerate, then this can't vanish unless I have the same mode, alpha is beta. It has to vanish. This can't ever do it. So this has to vanish. If on the other hand, alpha and beta are the same, this doesn't have to vanish because this vanishes, okay? So what does this tell me? Well, in the usual sense of oscillating system, this tells me that the two modes are orthogonal under this inner product, okay? So it's a shame I have to separate that statement from that statement by as much distance as possible, but anyway. So we have an inner product that we have just proved that two modes are orthogonal. Okay, so that, we, that means that if we take psi alpha and psi beta, just the spatial part, then this it could be something like an A alpha, let's say, maybe square it to get the dimensions right, times a delta. And this is just some normalization that I don't really care about. I set it to one, I don't know. What does this mean? Well, this means I have a basis. I have a basis in which I can express all the solutions if this is a complete set, which I'm going to assume doesn't have to be for rotating stars, there's some extra subtleties. That problem is much harder.
So that may seem like a fair bit to work, but actually that's really brilliant. Because now I have a handle on a way I can represent any solution to the problem, right? Which is good. So this brings us to ties. In the title problem, the equation is exactly the same. Apart from we have the title interaction. Some title potential chi from the partner drives the motion on the in the fluid on this star over here. So just to tell you what this is, the chi is the usual, have the gravitational potential from the other guy, some distance d, say, which depends on time because it could be orbiting and spiraling, whatever. And then I expand this, it's just the usual gm over r potential, but you've got m prime here, I've got m over here, and this xi is the, at distance, right? But I want to re-express this in, in this coordinate system here, right? Because that's where I'm working. And then what happens is you just expand that as yesterday, spherical harmonics, okay? You think this is actually a solution to Laplace's equation, which we met yesterday. So we know that the solution is going to go like, the radial coordinate to the elf power and some coefficients, okay? So this is gonna look something like this. You don't need to work out the coefficients. It's gonna be some sum over L's, some sum over M's, some coefficient, let's call it V, R to the L, spherical harmonic, and then E to the I M, some orbital phase, like that, I of V. So this is our problem, we want to solve this. But I have a basis. So I can just say, well, let the xi here simply be a sum over all the modes with some amplitude a n t, and then the solutions xi n, I of x. Just to make, make it explicit, this does not depend on t. There are the solutions there which don't care about time. But now I'm putting in a time dependence here. Okay? So also we know that the xi ends. So it's minus omega n squared psi n. n i. Let's do it like that. Be a bit liberal with where the n sits. It's not an index, it's just a label. Okay, so just to keep it out of the way. You know this, right? And so in this equation for the modes, I can just put minus omega n tie in instead of that guy, okay? And now it's easy to see, let's go over here. That we plug this in, yeah? Um, we get time derivatives, is second time derivative of this guy, because this doesn't care. Then this guy for the modes, and this doesn't care about the time, this just goes up front. This is acting on the xi n, the xi n's, are given here, okay? And then I get xi n out front. So it's easy to see this. This leads to a n, actually a sum for all the n's. Second time derivative of a n, two dots, plus omega n squared a n, acting on xi n, psi and i is minus grad i. So 
Sag ich was? The modes, remember, so this is like um, the same problem which you've probably seen in mechanics, right? Where you have a driven oscillator. The, mode, the comp modes provide a complete basis. So I can expand everything in them. And now I'm doing a driven problem. It's exactly like a driven resonator. Okay? I can expand it in this basis, which is assumed to be complete. So it can describe, it expands all the directions, right? So it's totally fair. So what happens now is I need to get rid of this xi, but I have this orthogonality. So I just multiply it by some other xi, right? And pull it through. So this then leads to um, minus, I pick up that, that guy, in the product of psi n and grad i. Pi. Oh, like that. Okay. So now then I have a an equation that says, how does the amplitude of these modes change because of the tide in this expansion? And if the orbit devolves, that will change. Okay. If there's no tide, this is just the mode equation, right? Because then this is omega n squared minus omega n squared, just trivial, is gone. Okay, now I don't want to keep on writing all of this because you can be writing enough anyway. Um, probably run out of time also. So let's see. Now what we're going to do is we're going to define a few things. First, we're going to introduce something called the overlap integral. And that's just saying, it's like a projection, right? This guy here is like a projection saying how much of this points in this direction in the solution space. So we're gonna call that an overlap integral. We just say this is Q for the mode N and that is just that thing. Rad I chi. And then if you look at what happens here, I can do an integration by part to make this a chi and that the de derivative of psi and then the thing that I have now erase that was good but basically the density perturbation is going to show up so this is just equal to minus delta rho star times chi dv and this is beginning to feel a little bit like multiple moments because remember that went like R to the L. And then we expand everything like this, right? Clearly here, I know this should be delta rho n. Delta rho n is just an expansion of this object that you expand in spherical harmonics. This guy is expanded in spherical harmonics over there. So this just brings out basically the multiple moments of the body. So actually this becomes something like QN is this V that I defined, VLM. I am, there's a star there, so there's a star there. E to the minus I M omega T if phi dot is omega so phi. So omega t. I'm just putting in an orbital frequency because we need frequencies later. Okay? And this i is just an integral over the body, delta rho n, n for some given l, r to the l plus two, ev. These are the mass multiple moments. <clears throat> so 
Now we're getting very close to solving this. We should make it without speeding up too much. Okay, so I want to solve. Just, these are just redefinitions, but they're helpful. So this is the thing I have on the right hand side, right? I just short hand note, notation for that. But this guy contains a lot of stuff that doesn't really enter the problem, like this, this thing, right? And then I want to pull out the time dependence. So I'm going to assume that the distance here changes very slowly, okay? So we're gonna take that to be fixed. So we have low, slowly evolving circular orbits effectively, okay? Just take that with you. Otherwise, it gets messy. If that's true, then uh, on the right hand side here, the only time dependence we have is there. Okay? This inner product is in space. It doesn't care about time. I can take that outside. Okay? Now you have a driven oscillator, right? With a driving term and non homogeneous. Differential, ordinary differential equation, some time dependent term over here. What you typically do is you guess the solution and say, well, the solution is going to have the same time dependence. Right? It's going to look similar to the driving force. So it's going to have to go like e to the minus i m omega t. That means that the a n's go like that. And that means that for this guy, you put get an m squared omega squared. So, as long as we're not in resonance, so let's just write that down as a warning to ourselves. It has to be that the solution picks up that coefficient v from here, picks up this thing. Picks up that coefficient a m squared, picks up the difference between the frequencies. And then the time dependence. And that's in principle the answer. It says that uh, there will be resonances in this problem that the orbital frequency approaches, in this sense, the modes. Okay? And this is going to blow up. The solution is not valid, but we can try to fix that some other time. Okay? But the way from resonances, this is, and actually, you put this in with all the modes that we know in this expansion, and there's your solution. But that's not quite what people do. So let's see if we can take the final step. We should be able to. So instead, in principle, we're done. But we have 13 minutes or something to waste. Right? So let's do that. At this point, people tend to introduce something called the love number from a geophysicist called Arthur Love that did this for the Earth a long time ago. And then Tanya Hindra and Aina Flanagan did this in gravity uh, not so long ago, not as long ago as Arthur Love. Um, and so the idea here is this, you introduce a number, let's call it KLM because we're carrying both the L's and the M's for now. where there should be a factor of two, I think, for convention, but it doesn't really matter. That mediates 
this guy here is the love number um, that mediates between the tidal potential, which we know, and the response of the star. Okay, how the gravitational potential of the star changes because it lives in the gravitational potential of the companion, and then there's some proportionality constant. Okay, that's the love number. But we have everything we need for this because we have the full solution. We know how the star responds, right? And so all we need to do is translate that into this, and we can compare, because we have this, we can write down an expression for this. That's what we're going to do, okay? I hope that's what we're going to do. So how does that go? Well, we need that guy, So what do we know? So we know that the full gravitational potential perturbation is a sum over all the gravitational potential perturbations associated with each of the modes, right? That has to be true. Because our expansion is in terms of the modes with some amplitude, take all the modes, add them up, that has to be true. And then I go and go, well, I know delta phi because that's also related to this mass multiple. I have the Poisson equation, which I can integrate with the Green's function. Okay. So that just says at the surface, we get delta phi n of r is some number four pi g from the Poisson equation. There's some two l plus one number. There's an r l to the plus one, and there's the i n, the same mass multiple as before. Okay. And then I know. For each mode, I know this, right? The ANs are here. I have that expression, okay? And then I have more because I know that the whole thing is expanded in spherical harmonics, right? So there's also a YLM attached to this, okay? And then I just compare to this, I'm done. And I'm not sure how much of that we should write out. Actually, let's just. No, it's not worth directing that. It's just a long expression where I write out the whole thing. Let's not do that because it's too much. So if we compare, we get two expressions. First, at KLM, the coefficient in between the two things that we know comes out as a number. Probably isn't that important what the number is. Or it's two pi g, two l plus one r to two l plus one, the r is the radius of the star, VLM, that no, VLM is gone, sorry. The sum over all the modes, let's say this n prime modes for given L and M. Before we summed over absolutely all the modes, right? Now we want just the modes for a given L and M. So let's call them M prime, okay? just to make a distinction. And then we have that funny sum we had this, this funny combination we had here. There's an i n there, there's an i n star, so there's just going to be an i n square. There's going to be an i n square over normalization, which we could, could have dropped, but it's there. Omega n prime <coughs> squared minus m squared omega squared.
So this is not the usual expression for the knot number that people have in gravitational wave physics, because this depends on the orbital frequency. This is more. This is a part of the dynamical type that evolves as the orbit evolves. Okay? And it's actually the equilibrium part because we haven't taken into account the resonance yet. And we're not going to because that will take much, much longer. The static love number, the number that was people using gravitational wave searches, um, follows from this. In the limit, but the orbital frequency is really slow, so far away. So we just drop this piece, and you see that there's a KLM that goes like 2 pi g, 2L plus 1, R to the 2L plus 1, some numbers. The sum of the modes that overlap multiple things squared over normalization squared, mode frequencies squared. And you see that this is not dependent on, say, the M. There's only one value for all the different M's. So this is a long, long exercise, in a way, starting from the need to do Lagrangian perturbations, writing down the mechanism, the calculations, how it goes, up to proving the orthogonality for the modes, turning to a real problem and applying this orthogonality, right? Just to see how it goes, okay? And it's taken us to something that's being used, actually not this form, but is relevant for current gravitational wave observations and something that will be relevant for future gravitational wave observations because we will need to worry about the fact that this, there's an enhancement here as you approach the resonances. And we need to worry about what happens as the mode goes through resonance. So that's something that a few people are working on right now with the eyes on next generation gravitational wave instruments. Okay. Two comments. If you just want to calculate this static love number, this what I've done is just idiotic. Because all you need to do is solve the static perturbation equations, and then this is just a couple of lines. So you wouldn't go through all of this. The problem is, once you've done that, you're done. You're not going to get any further. This argument gives me this, and it also gives me the framework for working out what happens at resonance. So I'm going much further. I'm reaching higher. It does one more thing. I'll just write it down and then make it clear. This is a hint, right? You can take this sum over all the modes, try to calculate these numbers, right? The frequencies and things. Plug it into this and ask, if I do that much simpler calculation for the static perturbation, I should get the same answer. This sum should converge. So you can prove that. We've done that. And it's quite an interesting thing because the modes could be different depending on things like um, the, what we talked about, those G modes and so on, right? But the static perturbation doesn't know that. It doesn't involve any of that stuff we talked about yesterday. So that's effectively in the infinitely 
where there are no reactions or anything. Right? And the star is kind of always in equilibrium. It doesn't know about P and G modes, well, they're nothing. But I can take different stars with different G modes here, and they still always converge to that number. Now, that is an indication that there is a universal relation between the mode sum and different properties. And that, I think, someone that's smart should be able to prove. That the mode sum is a step towards what people call universal relations. And the most fashionable in that respect is I love Q, where the moment of inertia, the love number, and the quadruple moment are related with different equations of state. But there seems to be a very strong relation between them. I think you can prove those things with this machinery. It hasn't been done. But there's work to do. Finally, 10 seconds. This calculation, I don't know how to do in general relativity. I'd love to, because we should, for realistic equations of state, etc. I have no idea. I know where to start. It's difficult because I don't have a proof of mode orthogonality. And I have serious doubts that the, from black hole perturbation theory that the modes will be complete. So that is unfinished business. It's a difficult problem that me and others are working on, but I don't think we're going to solve it soon. It's an open problem. You're welcome to it. I think for that, bang on time, we stop. Any questions before you're allowed to go? Yes, shoot. Um, if you have rotation, no, what happens is, so there's been work on the rotating problem, just exactly the same thing. Everything gets more complicated. We will see tomorrow how rotation splits the modes into there's more modes, if you like. Rotation also enters into these, all these orthogonality properties. Again, we're gonna see that, well, how this changes tomorrow, because I'm gonna use this for slowly rotating systems. Um, and you can, but you can do absolutely everything up to here. It just gets messy because you have to be very, very careful with those orthogonality properties and which modes are independent and things like that. But there's no damping to go with it. It's just exactly the same, but longer. Ah, okay. Okay, so this is uh, obviously set up for one star, right? You take the other star, it has the same kind of expression as long as they don't talk to each other. So if this star raises a tide on this guy, then this guy raises it, so you just add them up. But then the deformation of this guy is going to deform this guy. So the deformations are going to start talking about, talk to, talking to each other. But if this is a small effect, and that's going to be quadratically small. So probably you can ignore it. As the stars come closer in the spiral, at some point, this problem is nonlinear and you can't throw away those pieces. That's numerical relativity, or should be numerical relativity. So for now, in perturbation theory, you just add them. But at some point, you can't get away with that. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Great. Well. Go for lunch. <laughs>